Hello and welcome to another Atippling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan M.S. Pierce. I'm going to give you another walk through the front lines in the Ukraine conflict in Ukraine uh, and talk about a few other elements about the conflict that have taken place or are pertinent to the last few days. Uh, so let's return to our usual map. Uh, thank you, War Mapper, who provides these maps on a daily basis. So that's the front line. Not too much has changed again. Um, if you're used to the, the counter-offensives that took place and the lightning quick speed with which they took place, that's that was unusual. What is far more new, usual is a, an attritional war, um, attritional front lines where things take place very slowly, where it is grinding down um, the other side, whichever side you are. So let's have a look over at the, the northern area of the map concerning the northeast really uh, east of Kharkiv we have the Luhansk region and the Oskil river coming down here so still up in Kupiansk not a lot of change the uh, Ukrainians are pretty much hemmed in there by Russian artillery and where there has been some movement is between Izium and uh, Severodonetsk uh, where we have Lyman. So Lyman is uh, the kind of uh, focus of attention. Now there was a lot of uh, rumour yesterday that Lyman was finally uh, surrounded in a pincer movement. I don't think that has happened yet. I did say that it would fall. It doesn't seem to have been liberated as of yet, but there is movement to the west of um, Lyman. So there have been uh, Grover Yar has, is contested and there are these uh, other um, settlements Krimki and Oleksandrivka that I talked about yesterday that have been liberated uh, let's give you a little bit of a we'll, we'll look at Google Maps so here we've got Izium uh, here we've got Serodonetsk and uh, Sloviansk, Kramatorsk uh, we have the Siversky River and Lyman so Lyman and Izium, and it's this front between there. You might be able to make more sense in this kind of uh, map, the terrain map, because these forested areas are really important. They're very important for uh, the Ukrainians to launch attacks from there, and it's quite difficult to uh, hit hit people in forests, so you have a protect uh, a level of protection. So you've got the Oskil River that comes down here. You've got Rutsi and Lozove that have been liberated. Uh, you've got Lyman that hasn't, uh, and you've got uh, Droboshevi that has. There were rumours it had uh, been liberated, but that is now contested, and there's another. Nova Salivka that is also being contested at the moment. So you've got this front from really f over here near the Oskil all the way to Lyman. And if I show you the map that I've created here, so you've got these liberated settlements, Rutsi, uh, Lozove, and uh, Korovi Yar is being contested. So you've got the Ukrainians attacking that from several directions. Nova Salivka is being contested as well and Drobosheve too but there is some kind of uh, mini salient some little bridgehead that's been uh, formed just to the west of Laman and this is where there's thought to be you know an imminent pincer movement taking place as Laman is being attacked from multiple directions lots of uh, little uh, fronts down in the south um, and pretty much all over and then this this pincer movement around there and there might be a, a, a push through from the east so that's what's happening really there, there's several you know there, there are several little attacks or, or constant uh, attempts to break the line all the way along this line uh, the Russians are kind of holding out um, uh, there is some rumor that there is some mechanized uh, you know division back here but that could just be Russian rumors just to say you know watch your backs but actually you know if that was there why hasn't that been brought forward to do the defensive work here so uh, that's that's could just be rumor um, and this is obviously very important for uh, 
the the Ukrainians going forward. They really need to break through here. So Svatove, it, the rail line there is is not useful for the Russians at the moment. So really it's about this railway line coming, coming down Starobilsk and that's got to be the main objective, Starobilsk, uh, because that will cut off uh, logistics to much of the Donetsk front. But they are going to want to really flank these this conurbation of Rubizhne, uh, Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, which they are also attacking, you know, from this direction too. Uh, so that's the situation at the moment in that part of the woods. Now that I have my uh, my shiny yellow mouse, that should be a lot easier. I do apologise. I keep forgetting about that. Um, so we'll take a look further down uh, the uh, the front lines here. So it's all kind of happening around Liman. There's also this uh, this attempt by the Ukrainians to move in through Spina and to flank a sort of salient that's been uh, produced by the Russians uh, further south and you've got Bakhmut uh, so if they if the Ukrainians can get behind here then they can cause some merry havoc behind the lines it's worth noting that uh, they need to be acting pretty quickly now the Ukrainians because it could be as early as a week into mobilization that you might start seeing troops reinforcing the front lines uh, and so it would be advantageous for the Ukrainians to do as much as they can in the next week. So I don't know whether the, the calls to mobilization ha have for, uh, are going to affect the Ukrainian decision making going forward. Whether this next week you might see things happening that might have taken a bit more time to, to prepare for. I don't know. That's just me thinking there. But uh, but certainly you are going to start seeing mobilized troops probably from a week onwards. It depends how much training they're going to get and whether they're, they're going to give training at all to some of them and just throw them straight on the front line. Maybe some of the more experienced troops they can get away with uh, shoving on the front lines. Uh, it's not to say that everyone's going to go on the front lines. They need to be tooling up the whole logistical net uh, logistics network. Um, and you know there are, there are. They will need people right throughout the the whole organization of the armed forces. So it, it, it's hard to say. It's not that I'm sure that the entire bunch of troops will be thrown straight onto the front line. I don't think that will happen. Now, going further down south to uh, the Bakhmut area, um, there is there have been rumors that... Um, that, so just to let you know that's over there, I don't know what's happened to my uh, cursor there, it's turned into a big magnifying glass. So uh, there have been rumours that Ukraine have actually taken back some um, some terrain around Bakhmut, but there's also been uh, the evidence that uh, the Russians have done so themselves. In fact, uh, um, Russian sources claim that Russian forces captured Zaitseve, that's back in uh, September the 19th, but they also claim that with Ukrainian forces withdrew from eastern Bakhmut across the Bakhmutova River uh, on September the 22nd. So that's all come from the Russians. It's a couple of days old, but there is there is some evidence to suggest that uh, that the Ukrainians have made some progress in uh, a kind of counterattack here. Now, this might well be because the Russians have uh, seemingly withdrawn some of their troops to support uh, from the Bakhmut area, some of the Wagner mercenaries to support um, issues going on further north from there. Uh, other than that, uh, there is there is fighting around Andi uh, Andivka, and that has been going on for some time now. That is, uh, there is still uh, some hotly contested area around there. Uh, otherwise, things are pretty quiet on the Zaporizhia front line. Uh, nothing seems to have happened there particularly um, and really it's it's a case of going to Kherson again so what's going on in Kherson again not a lot of change there's uh, some attempts to go down this highway um, in the southern section here towards Kherson but really no progress at all the Russians are hitting this uh, salient here with quite a lot of artillery the question is how long can their artillery last given that their supplies have been cut uh, as soon as their 
artillery sort of runs out of of ammunition, then you know you can only see the Ukrainians making steady advances. But at the moment, they are being hemmed in to some extent by Russian artillery, and the same up north here as well. So not a lot of movement in Kherson. However, in this area, we have had uh, a lot of reports of Iranian. Um, UAVs, unmanned aerial sort of vehicles, drones that are kamikaze drones, so loitering munitions. That means that they are themselves, they're not only drones, but they carry munitions on board and they just fly down and blow themselves up on whatever it is they are being directed towards. Now, this is causing a growing problem for the Ukrainians. So let's have a little look at that. So let's have a little talk about these Iranian drones. Um, before I go into the drones, let's have a look at a cruise missile here. This is a very sort of well common, I say common, it's expensive uh, cruise missile that the Russians use. The caliber cruise missile comes in quite a few different forms, but it can carry about 500 gram, uh, kilograms of explosives. Okay, so that's quite a lot of ordnance and that, that gets sent off, you know, different... Um, different vessels and installations. Okay, so the caliber that's causing problems behind these uh, the front lines here. So you know that you, they can hit Mekalaev, they can hit Odessa, uh, uh, Kriviri, Ria, um, all these pla any any of these places with cruise missiles. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so what does that have to do with? the Iranian drones. Well, although they've got up to 500 kilograms of explosives, I think it's 480 or something, uh, they cost uh, about six $6.5 million each, okay? So that they are expensive things and they can get shot down by um, air defense systems that the Ukrainians have and often do get shot down. Sometimes all of them get shot down. So say six missiles might be attacking Mikhailov. It might be that all of them get shot down. It might be that one gets shot down. So in other words, that's a lot of money uh, and doesn't always succeed in doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, well, what has happened is that, that the Ukrainians uh, are now coming up against these Iranian drones. So let's check this out as an example. All that noise you can hear are small arms fire initially. So they're trying to shoot that, that down with anything they can because it gets through uh, radar and surface to air systems. It, it's arguably too small or made of wood so they can't be detected. Uh, and, or, and the components, the metal components are too small. Um, and so they're trying to hit it with uh, initially small arms fire. And then you can hear some anti-aircraft guns, maybe the Gepard, the, the German one I talked to you about. So the, these are a bit of a menace at the moment. Uh, here we have for the first time ever on camera a Russian uh, Jiran 2, Iranian Shahid 136, a loitering munition was shot down by Ukrainian air defences over Dnipropetrovsk Oblast. Um, and I probably butchered that. So you can see that has quite a lot of munitions on board to be hit. It obviously can be hit by certain munitions. Um, it's just the radar it is not is not easily detectable on the radar. So here, um, so how the Ukrainian forces are also having to turn to much more rudimentary methods, such as small arms fire, as seen here over Odessa. The interception of these loitering munitions is certainly problematic for the Ukrainian forces at the moment, as I was saying. No. 
So that's just a slowed down clip, uh, and you can see it's been hit by small lines fire, and and a part of that has been has has shot off. Um, and so these these drones are causing a right old nightmare for the uh, Ukrainians because they can carry a hundred kilograms of explosives. So that's a fifth of uh, over a fifth, depending on what what missile it is, of caliber cruise missiles, and a fraction of the cost. So let's uh, see where they're getting these from, uh, and this is e exceptionally interesting. So I'm going to be referencing a fascinating article in the Dispatch, Why Russia is Using Iranian-Made Drones in Ukraine. I'll try not to read it all, but it is really, really interesting. Um, so what's been happening is that uh, these drones have been showing up. Now, I mentioned that recently four cargo planes had, had touched down in Moscow, indicating that they were starting to get stuff from um, Iran that Russia were, were, sanctions were biting and they were getting stuff from Iran. And, and each of these planes were supposedly holding at least 100 of these uh, drones each. Well, if you look at the stats that, that the dispatch brings up, last month, open source flight data showed that up to 42 Iranian cargo flights had landed in Moscow since Putin ex expanded his invasion of Ukraine in February, up from, and this is the key, up from three cargo flights in 2021. In other words, that's a 39 extra flights. That that is correlated with the war taking place. Wow! So that is appearing. One would one would assume it's those are packed with uh, armaments and munition, uh, allowing Russia to get around um, the sanctions. Now, Iran themselves are sanctioned in, in many ways. So, and we'll come on to that. Um, and Iran have sold several types of, of drone to Russia, the Shahid 171, 129 and 191, which then Russia sort of repurposes and renames. Uh, Russia is one of only few space faring nations. So what are they doing getting these off of um, off of Iran? Well, they need them. They, they are uh, they are being hammered by sanctions. Um, so uh, uh Every modern drone needs gyroscopes, tilt sensors, electrical motors, microchips and sophisticated payloads used for surveillance. Russian industry may be able to master making aluminium wings and fuselages for modern drones, but the guts seem to still be heavily dependent on foreign imports. And this is where Iran comes in. Unlike Russia, Iran has been under heavy Western sanctions and various forms of economic and technological pressure for decades. So Iran can't get Israeli drones uh, and Israeli and American and other espionage and law enforcement services work hard to make it difficult for Iran to get drone parts. This has forced Iran to work harder to get the crucial components through smuggling and subterfuge or actually produce their own or figure out which Chinese components work almost as well as Western ones. Iran has a relatively sophisticated military drone program despite these constraints. So actually, Iran has capability, drone capability, even though they are sanctioned. How do they do this? Well, one way of getting around it is dual-use technology components. So that's that's to say that they are getting these components saying, oh, we need this for, I don't know, CCTV cameras or domestic uh, whatever, some kind of appliance or some uh, some kind of camera that we're, that we're making. But actually, those components can be used in drones as well. So they they are those components aren't sanctioned because they say they're going to be used for X, but actually they use them for Y. So dual use technology components are one uh, way that Iranian drone makers can avoid scrutiny and mass produce combat drones. The heart of the drone is the engine, and the Iranian Iranian uh, Shahed. Uh, 129 drone uses a Rotax 914 aircraft engine, the same as used on US Predator drones. So that is manufactured in Austria by the BRP Rotax company, which is in turn owned by Canadian company Bombardier Recreational Products. So the question is, how did these companies, the Canadian and Austrian companies who are dead against Russia and really pro-Ukraine, how are they getting away with selling these components to Iran. Uh, and the dispatch approach to companies, and this Austrian company said, we sell Rotax aircraft engines through an independent worldwide network of distributors, and our engines are exclusively designed and produced for civil purposes and are certified by the applicable civil regulatory authority. Again, 
supply or not again but the supply lines you know once you sell it to to an intermediary and they sell it to someone else and sells it to someone else it then gets it into iran there you go so so austria may be selling selling to someone who promises to use it for civil usage it then sells it to someone else sells it to someone but and eventually that kind of provenance gets lost or or the 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 regulations are not adhered to and it gets through to iran and iran can use these these components to make uh, what are I- incredibly cheap drones relative to the cost of, say, the caliber cruise missile. So if you're thinking the payload is about a fifth of the caliber, but it's not going to even be costing a fifth, not by long, they could, you know, there, there are, who knows how many of these they can make for one sing for the cost of one single caliber weapon. And, you know, so all, all all they need is, you know, five of these drones to hit somewhere as it would be equivalent to one uh, caliber missile. Um, so it, it, it's this is a real problem um, and it, it gets rather confusing uh, and complex. Sorry, complex is the right word. So there are implications for the United States, says the dispatch. Ukraine and its supporters have repeatedly called for Russia to be designated a state sponsor of terrorism. Biden has thus far decided against any such declaration, despite Russia's support for terrorist organizations in Ukraine, despite Russia's sabotage attacks inside NATO countries, despite Russia's massive use of terror against the Ukrainian civil population. The Shahed-129 drones are manufactured by Quads Aviation Industries of Tehran. This state-owned firm has been sanctioned by the UN, the US and other others as an entity controlled by the IRGC. In 2012, the EU listed this company as linked to Iranian nuclear activities. The US has designated the IRGC as a foreign terrorist organisation. So the act of purchasing these drones directly from an IRGC controlled entity might not fit the narrow definition of having repeated, quote, repeatedly provided support for acts of international terrorism, as the US Department of State seems to indicate. But if Russia has purchased military drones from Quads Aviation Industries, it is fair to say that Russia has sponsored a foreign terrorist organization. So this is fascinating. The ramifications of Russia buying these from uh, Iran means that they are state sponsors of terrorism, you know, by proxy, Russia, and arguably are obviously a terrorist state themselves, uh, as many people are calling for them to be. So this is, these, I think, will be a huge problem going forward. Now, the one thing Ukraine has in their, uh, ad- to their advantage is that Russian reconnaissance is not very good. So when they are flying these drones over to certain places, they are not always hitting their intended targets or they don't know necessarily, they don't have up-to-date information that they're intended targets. The massive advantage that that Ukraine has is the capability of their real-time intelligence that is provided by the US and NATO uh, countries. And this is something we're going to talk about now. And just concerning those mobilized troops, the uh, defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, said that there will be 300,000 reservists called up. Uh, this is according to the Kiev Independent, um, who say the Medusa, the sort of Russian media outlet, uh, plans, Russia plans to mobilize 1.2 million conscripts for the war against Ukraine. Um, so Medusa, uh, a Russian media outlet, cited a government source. In Moscow, the authorities seek to mobilize up to 16,000 people, uh, according to a source close to Moscow's city hall. Um, and this is what many sort of critics had rumored would take place, is that actually 300,000 is uh, an attempt to play it down so that it wouldn't be too much discontent from the public and that it, the reality is far more would be would be called up but it wouldn't be official and uh, if that is the case will there be a pyrrhic victory so i am going to refer you to a twitter thread by chris doherty who's an adjunct senior fellow for, uh, defense program so he's a, a defense strategist for the center for new american security and it, this is a a fascinating Twitter thread because what we have is um, Ukraine being able to use a a whole bunch of tech and uh, tactics and strategy and capability um, from NATO and from allies. 
their materiel that they are accessing is of a greater capability than the Russian materiel. So the Russians have a seemingly endless supply of troops uh, as they're mobilizing, but they don't appear to have much capability because their materiel is obsolete or old or just not as good. So even when it comes to the stuff that does work uh, well, um, you know, like their artillery, it doesn't have the capability of the NATO artillery that is starting to come in for the Ukrainians. They do have caliber cruise missiles and, and cruise missiles, but again, you know, how how many of them do they have? Uh, what does it look like going uh, long term? But there is this debate, as there has long been, between capability and capacity. So this thread, uh, I'll read it to you. I won't read it all. It's a long old thread, so I'll try and pick and choose. But Russia's mobilization versus Ukraine's increasingly Western equipped force could be the nearest thing to the an empirical case study in the long running dispute between capability and quality and capacity or quantity in defense strategy and force planning. Before continuing, I want to note that this is an abstract analysis, but there's nothing abstract about the tragedy of this war. Um, so some insights coming. So within a given budget, Department of Defense force planners must balance the iron triangle of capability, buying better kit, capacity, retaining more forces, or readiness, keeping forces ready for war. Doing all three blows the budget. Tensions between spending in these areas shape many, if not most, debates on US defense strategy, such as arguments about the size and shape of the Navy's fleet, which I discussed in uh, in, in a piece he wrote. Um, and actually, this is a debate that's been going on in the UK as well. In fact, all NATO operations is like, how much money do we spend? Do we, do we get more boots on the ground or boots on a ship? Or do we get, you know, better ships? Less is more or more is more. Um, so these tensions also color the debate over the Marine Corps Force Design 2030, which has sacrificed capacity and some capabilities to increase the Corps' ability to defer or defeat Chinese aggression. So in particular capabilities, spending that money means that they can't spend it on, say, extra troops. Um, so we're going to cut back on troops because we are going to spend money on these bits of tech. And they partly drive the debate over whether China is preparing to invade Taiwan in, by 2027. Um, US Indo-Pacific Command likes this date because they care about readiness for near-term threats, whereas thinking about 2030 might emphasize capability. So do you think it, it, this is, do we need to spend money on being ready by a, a shorter date, or do we want to spend money on, on long-term capabilities? These debates are essentially about allocating resources against risk, red, readiness for near-term risk, capability for long-term, capacity for uh, diffuse or protracted risk, uh, capability for specific acute risk. This is general, the specifics get fuzzier. What does this have to do with Ukraine and Russia? A key theme in these debates is maintaining capacity size versus investing in capability. Western arms and Ukrainian aptitude and uh, adaptability are transforming Ukraine's military into an increasingly capable force armed with modern weapons and personnel who can process info and make good decisions quickly. Despite starting the war with a capability advantage on paper, the Russian armed forces are devolving as they expend key munitions, take attrition, lose scarce officers and give away some of their newest kit. Mobilization will likely worsen Russia's growing capacity gap, capability gaps as new or reconstituted units draw from increasingly obsolete stocks of weapons. Any hope for success will rest on the old adage that quantity has a quality all its own. It's important to note that these gaps aren't across the board. Russia likely retains the edge in air power and naval forces, and again, those caliber missiles that, that go from there. But in key areas like intel, command and control, and precision fires, uh, and I was going to talk today about the difference between HIMARS and GRAD, so the Rus Russian rockets, multiple rocket launchers, just throw up a volley of dumb munitions that land randomly, whereas the Ukrainians are using HIMARS that do precision warfare, but I'll do that in a future video. Ukraine seems to have taken the lead. Capability versus capacity mismatches have happened at before, and he goes on to talk about how, how over history those mismatches have been shown to be really important, but this is perhaps 
So as he says here, Ukraine, therefore, seems like the first modern campaign level conventional conflict in which one side is using information age tech to offset numerical disadvantage, while the other is relying on mass industrial era approaches to offset capability gaps. The implications of this war, therefore, have serious long term ramifications for how defense planners think about future warfare. If Ukraine wins, it could give momentum to aggressive modernization efforts like the third offset. But if Russian mass uh, stymies Ukrainian capability, defence planners will have to figure out how and why and adjust accordingly, perhaps by making larger investments in cheaper systems that can be bought in large numbers to counter enemy mass. This is where the U Iranian um, cheap but uh, pretty capable drones are really interesting. So they're fairly capable, although they they are lacking in intelligence and reconnaissance. And if they can get loads of them, then they have kind of a capacity as well. So that's really, this is why I think those Iranian drones are going to be something to really watch out for. Putting my cards on the table, I think Ukraine's capability advantages, especially its ability to gather and process info quickly, so they're using the satellite information and NATO intelligence, to make decisions and strike targets with precision combined with its superior leadership and morale will prove operationally decisive. This assumes uh, a few key points. One, continued Western supply of weapons and intelligence. Two, additional weapons, Western tanks, to offset Russian numbers. A conti three, continued Ukrainian mobilization, even if they can't match Russian numbers. And four, no Russian nuclear use. It also assumes continued Russian incompetence. More forces only matter if they have morale training, supplies, information, and command and control. Russian forces haven't had much of these so far, and mobilization likely makes these problems worse, not better. Over the next several months, mobilization could produce new compact units. This could both increase Russian capacity and simplify uh, their C2 by reducing their reliance on a patchwork of LDR, uh, DPR forces, Rosgavardia, etc. So they're reducing their, their reliance on these, um, these nationalist forces from the Donetsk and Luhansk regions and their military police. Um, long term, mobilization is a signal of Putin's willingness and ability to keep fighting. As brutal as it sounds, Russia can trade soldiers and old vehicles for expensive Western weapons and ultimately come out ahead. So that's this kind of idea of a Pyrrhic victory. This may be my US bias showing, but if Western aid continues, I think historical cases suggest Ukraine can beat a larger Russian force comprising untrained, unmotivated, poorly led, poorly supplied, mobilized forces using outdated equipment. That's a fascinating um, thread there. Really, really good to, sh to, to get the debate rolling about capability versus capacity, which we are really seeing. Ukraine have capability, but arguably not the capacity that Russia have. Russia have a whole bunch of materiel just not very good stuff anymore and a whole bunch of troops they can draw on or, or humans they can draw on and they can throw that against the Ukrainians and will they through attrition and Pyrrhic kind of um, thinking uh, overcome the Ukrainians uh, that's the question uh, I would generally agree with Dorothy here that I think uh, Ukraine will eventually they're always going to win because Russia can't I, I don't understand what Putin wants out of this, what what he thinks winning is, um, other than just carrying this on and, and grinding Ukraine down. But they can never occupy Ukraine. They can never really win in the in the broad sense that they initially went into Ukraine thinking they would do quickly. They can't do that. It is it is impossible to do that. OK, so therefore, what is winning for Putin? That's the diamond question. And I don't know. Maybe he doesn't know because he's in this and he feels he can't get out of it and he has to come out winning, but he can't come out winning like he wants to. So ah, and um, it's just uh, pretty fascinating. Anyway, uh, that's probably enough for today. I had loads more I was going to talk about. Um, but uh, I'll have to leave it for another day. Um, uh, uh, other than to say, I suppose really quickly at the end, that um, these referendums, these referenda that are taking place in, in the occupied regions or semi-occupied regions, four regions of uh, Donetsk, uh, Luhansk, neither of which are fully uh, under Russian control, Zaporizhia, which is definitely not, and Kherson, which is, is, is contested. So these referendums are happening, referenda are happening, and uh, it is looking 
utterly sham. So here's um, a translation of Astra Press story uh, that in Zaporizhia two women go from house to house with a portable ballot box and ballots. They are accompanied by five armed soldiers. People are ticking yes because the machine guns are aimed at them. Those who try to protest or put against are taken away. Residents of uh, Vasilyevka uh, who have been living under occupation for more than six months share with Astra. So that's a, a fascinating insight. Um, we have uh, here is a um, uh, an example of <laughs> the the press compared to the amount of people here. Um, so just l all of these clicking um, cameras for one person. Uh, of course, it's not even uh, confidential. What is what is? But you know, you, it's just it's insane. Look at all these people. It's just a sham. This is all about optics for Russia. Um, uh, and here we have a, a video of um, a soldier accompanying ballots uh, and people, uh, you know, going about trying to do a democratic <laughs> job. Uh, and they're just, you know, soldiers front and back at, uh, you know, with their guns. It's absolutely, uh, it's just a complete, complete sham. Anyway, uh, we'll wait to see what effect this has and whether it just gives Russians the permission to go gung-ho in the whole area and have a mass mobilization if Ukraine attack what are newly um, uh, designated Russian territories. Uh, anyway, there you go. Hope that's been of, of some interest to you. As ever, question everything and question everything I say. A couple of people have been questioning things I've been saying without actually questioning the things I say. So saying, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. It's like, okay, I am literally just reporting stuff that's happening. Uh, I am giving my own thoughts on certain things. But if you disagree with me, don't just say you're speaking rubbish, right? You need to lay out how you think I'm wrong and substantiate your claims because otherwise it just looks like russian bot okay and this is this is the same with philosophy you know don't just come along and say you're wrong come along and say you're wrong on x y and z and for all of these reasons right and i'm going to substantiate my criticisms and attack you for that but if you're not going to do that don't bother commenting um anyway that's just uh, my opinion on that uh thanks for your support please like subscribe share and um, I'll see you again for lots more to say in another video. I might not have a chance on Sunday to do it, but certainly on Monday there'll be a lot of content.